This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. This week's Changemaker is Brad Hargraves, the founder and CEO of Common. Brad and his team design and manage multifamily apartments with more than 5,000 residents in over 10 markets across the country. Brad, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, Katie. Brad, you've been named to high profile lists like Ernest & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year and Vanity Fair's Next Establishment. Tell us more about your business endeavors and what you're doing to win such great awards. (laughs) Well, uh, I I, I certainly appreciate the the question. Um, You know, I'm I'm, I'm not, I don't set out to, uh, you know, to to, to get those those kind of accolades, but it's it's certainly nice to, uh, to see. I would say, you know, I got my start really in the education space, kind of at the intersection of that and technology. I started uh, with a few friends, a business called General Assembly in the last downturn, 2000, uh, around 2010, um, really because we saw that there was a gap between what people were learning in universities and what was needed in the workforce. We built that to be the largest trade school in the US teaching things like web development, UX design, and data science, and have during that process of building the business uh, we saw a lot of needs on the housing side, not just for our students, but for our instructors, for our employees. Um, you know, we had urban campuses in places like New York, DC, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And when many of our, uh, you know, instructors, our employees would come to these cities, they wouldn't even bother looking for an apartment. They would look for a room on Craigslist. Um, and so we, we, we looked at this from a consumer product perspective, which is different than how a lot of people in real estate approach it. And we said there's a real need for uh, a, an operator to come in and design and think about housing with the consumer foremost in mind. Um, and so I've always, you know, you know, and that's what we built at Common and happy to dive more into that. But I think I've just always approached these issues really without a lot of ego and just saying, you know, let's iterate, you know, let's start with a hypothesis and then test, test, test and find what resonates for the consumer, find what works, um, and then double down on that. Uh, and between what we did in education at General Assembly and what we're doing at Common, um, you know, we've seen success in both those fields by just being very focused on the customer's needs and, and, and testing around a thesis. So let me ask a question because you made a real leap here. You know, you graduated from Yale with a molecular biology degree, and then you, what did you do next to kind of go, you move yourself to housing from that degree? Oh God, it's been a, it's, it's certainly been a, been a winding road. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I, in school, I, I, when I, when I started, I, I thought I wanted to start a biotech company. Um, I was really interested uh, in, 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 in the world of biotechnology. Um, I think as uh, I went through college, I realized that um, I was much more interested in, in, in entrepreneurship as a practice, being an entrepreneur, um, than I was about any particular part of the biotech sphere. So I got my start, I started a game development studio uh, my, my, um, when I was around 20, um, raised my first venture dollars, uh, got big and popular, but I had no idea what I was doing. So we, uh, we ran that into the ground and, and the layoffs we had to do were, were probably the most challenging part of my professional career and certainly um, gave me a lot of, uh, I would say, context and experience that, that I never want to do that again. And that, you know, the businesses we would start going forward um, would be kind of set up on really solid financial ground, would solve real problems um, and would be fundamentally rooted in the consumer need. So that I think gave me uh, a fair bit of, of, of experience the hard way um, and kind of got me into General Assembly and then Common. How did Common evolve from being a co-living company to one of the most recognizable property management brands in the country? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's been an evolution over the, over the six years that uh, we've been in business and probably the least appreciated um, part of what we do at Common. And, you know, 
going back to my earlier answer, it's really all about seeing the consumer need um, and addressing that need. Um, and one thing we saw and we noticed pretty early on um, is that one, you know, doing small buildings, doing a 20 unit, 30 unit building at a time, we were never really going to address the depth of consumer need. 25 million Americans live with roommates. Um, there's a massive need for affordable housing uh, in major American cities. And we just weren't going to reach a size to solve the need doing uh, a small building at a time. So we needed to work with larger owners, larger developers to produce co-living inventory, micro apartment inventory at scale. Um, and part of the way to do that um, is to think about these new typologies, not as standalone products, um, but as actually part of a broader ecosystem. Uh, because if you're talking to a large institutional owner, they would be happy to build 100, 200 co-living units, but as part of a 400 unit mixed use project. Um, and so that was one learning we had pretty early on. The other learning is that the co-living renters are not fundamentally different than your traditional apartment renters. Um, they're really just a, maybe a couple years earlier in their career um, from an income standpoint, from a, a relationship standpoint. And so what we often see, you know, when we're managing co-living units within buildings with, 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 with other types of units, studios and one bedrooms, um, the co-living renters will upgrade to the studios and ones after a year or two of living and co-living. And that's actually a, a good thing. They get a, they get a pet, they get a significant other, uh, they start making a bit more money at their job. Um, and so as we saw that consumer need, and then we saw the, uh, the owner, the developer need um, to build more mixed use buildings, that became the norm. And our, over the course of a year, our typical deal went from a 50 unit, 100% co-living building to a 200 unit building that had say 100 co-living combined with 100 conventional where we were the manager of the entire building. In that journey, we also saw opportunities to add value in conventional units as well. Based on you know who we are and our backgrounds, we come from a very tech forward world where we're, we're using best in class technologies, you know, processes that any great consumer brand would use to do things like market, to sell, customer experience and customer support. And we saw that a lot of the things we were doing were a step above what conventional residential property managers were doing. Um, and so we started even getting brought into very typical buildings with no co-living whatsoever and often by existing clients, sometimes by new clients. And so we've really broadened the focus of what we're doing to, from being a, a, a co-living operator to being a housing operator where co-living is a, is a pretty important part of what we do. So that's been a transformation over the past 18 months, and we're really excited about what's to come in the future there. You mentioned tech forward and customer support. You know, are there design differences or are there management differences with co-living rentals? Yeah, so for co-living, there's, there's typically both. The way to think about co-living is a renter is effectively renting a private bedroom, usually with a private bathroom within a shared suite. So they're sharing a kitchen, they're sharing a living room, but they have their own private bedroom and bathroom. The dynamic you see there from a design standpoint is the more bedrooms you have sharing a given kitchen and living area, the more you're able to push rent down. And so different developers put that sweet spot in various places. So some developers say, hey, I'm just going to build three bedroom apartments. Uh, you know, the rent is going to be at a 20% discount to a studio. Others say, you know, I'm going to build a five or a six bedroom apartment with larger bedrooms and the rent is going to be, you know, 30%, 35% cheaper than a studio. And that's including Wi-Fi, shared supplies, weekly cleaning of all the shared spaces. Uh, it's fully furnished. So I would say just different risk reward trade-offs that our real estate partners take when designing co-living. You know, there, there are have clearly design differences uh, in co-living versus your conventional multifamily. There tend to be more amenity spaces in co-living as well, more shared spaces. You know, we've been building co-working into our co-living spaces. 
um, places for people to go out of their suite to work, to hang out, what have you, for, for a number of years. And now that's becoming more popular since COVID. What I would say from a management standpoint is, you know, we take a, a more a more centralized approach where everyone from inbound leads to kind of first layer customer support requests go first to a central office where we're able to get back to people a lot faster. We're able to diagnose issues and then bounce that back to our individual buildings, you know, whether it's set up a tour, whether it's send out a maintenance tech to a unit. Um, we found a lot of efficiencies from there. We've also found better customer experience as we're getting back to people faster than uh, someone on site could, particularly with small buildings. It's a, it's, it's, it's a really meaningful difference. So we do have a very different management approach and uh, that, that management approach we keep um, even when we're going into, into conventional assets. You know, do you guys describe yourself as a community driven company or how would you guys describe your overall management approach as a company? Yeah, totally. So it's it's obviously important to us that we are building friendly places to live. Um, I think one of the hardest parts, and, and you know, I experienced this firsthand moving to New York City, um, is when you move into a big building and it's 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 anonymous. Nobody says hi in the elevator. Uh, you don't know your next door neighbor. You know, there's 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 nothing going on, and you kind of have to seek out your own your own community. Um, so we want to give that option for people who. You know, particularly, you know, about half of our residents are new to the city in which they're moving. And we see that uh, renewal rates jump significantly if people who move into common uh, make a good friend in the building within their first two weeks. So there are a lot of benefits to community. That being said, um, we don't want to be overly prescriptive about it. Um, when we ask people kind of why they moved into a, a common home, even in co-living, you know, about 80% of them site, either affordability or convenience. Um, only about 20% are citing community as the number one reason. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind. And, 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 and what we don't want to do is create something that feels exclusive, that feels like a club. Um, that's not what we're trying to do here. It's fundamentally about creating a great housing solution for a wide swath of people. So it has to be friendly. It can't be anonymous. You know, people should feel comfortable going next door and asking for the uh, proverbial cup of sugar. And that's on us to set that culture and set that tone. But it's it's not about, hey, every Friday night there's the huge raucous party and everyone's expected to come. You know, and, and that's a that's a line to walk, but it's uh, been pretty important to us for the past six years to, to walk that line. Are these co-living spaces more of a New York City phenomenon or are there other cities embracing this approach? No, so for for for, for co living specifically, we're we're operating in about a dozen cities today, and it's certainly not uh, exclusive to you know the New Yorks and San Franciscos in any way, shape, or form. Living with roommates, sharing a home or apartment, uh, that is not just a big gateway city phenomenon. People do that uh, throughout the United States. Um, I would say it is it does tend to associate with places with higher rents. You know, as people are looking for a more affordable way to live in the neighborhood they want to live. Uh, but frankly, there are a lot of cities that have fairly high rents these days. And we kind of look at our rule of thumb is, is co-living works anywhere one bedroom apartment rents are more than $1,200 a month. Um, so once you kind of cross that $1,200 threshold, um, co-living can make financial sense both for the owner and for the developer. So uh, you know, we've seen co-living work really well in, in places like Philadelphia and in, in South Florida and Chicago that are all kind of near that twelve to fifteen hundred dollar one bedroom rent number. So not um, so they're urban, but not necessarily uh, high rent. OK, well, hang on, Brad. We're going to take a break. But coming up in the second part of my discussion with changemaker Brad Hargraves, the founder and CEO of Common. Brad talks to us about how his team is leveraging technology to improve the lives of their residents. When a lot of people think about, you know, residential technology, they think about kind of, you know, whiz bang gadgets hooked to the wall. But for us, 98% of our focus is actually on the software side. And of that focus on software, I would say 80% is actually focused more on back office automation, quality and efficiency you know, as opposed to 
tenant experience, although obviously there's a tight relationship between those two. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.